Hello friends, welcome to NIOS. Myself, Dr. Yukti Sharma from Department of Education, University of Delhi. Today we are going to discuss with you about disability acts and policies. Let's begin with the case. Surely, a 14-year-old disabled girl was denied admission in an MCD school in class 5 on the grounds that she was average over age and hence not eligible for admission. The High Court of Delhi in Social Jurist versus Union of India and others held that surely being a disabled child has the fundamental right to have access to free education in an appropriate environment till she attains the age of 18 as guaranteed to her under Articles 21 and 45 of the Constitution of India, read with the provisions of Section 26 of the Persons with Disability Act 1995. As a result, Sholly was given admission to the school. Age relaxation up to 5 years has also been granted to students with disabilities in higher education. The University Grants Commission had in its letter dated July 2006 advised the registrars of all universities and deemed universities to provide relaxation up to maximum of 5 years to persons with disabilities in admission to various courses which shows that our constitution as well as various policies, commissions and acts are there who encourage and enable the people with disabilities. So today we are going to see which acts, laws, policies are working for the disabled. We will begin with an international perspective because it, it's the international initiatives which have actually encouraged and actually made changes in the Indian scenario also. The international perspective. Now in the international perspective, the first was the Universal Declaration of Human Rights 1948 that proclaimed education as a right for all children, reiterated by the World Declaration on Education for All 1990, added that the learning needs of the disabled required special attention and recommended that steps were needed that could provide equal access to education to every category of disabled persons. Now this international initiative led to what we today call as RCI or Rehabilitation Council of India Act 1992, Persons with Disability Act 1995 and National Trust Act 1999 in India. The next international initiative was the UN General Assembly's Declaration of 1981 as the International Year of Disabled Persons. Followed by this, the UN Proclamation of 1983 to 1992 as the Decade of the Disabled, followed by the Decade of the Disabled Persons even from 1993 to 2002. The next initiative which is very important again was the UN Standards uh, rules on the equalization of opportunities for persons with disabilities 1993 that recommended improvement in the educational conditions of persons with disability which we just discussed led to the RCI Act, PWD Act and National Trust Act. Another important breakthrough in the field of children with disability was the World Conference on Special Needs Education, Salmanica which is 1994. Now, in June 1994, various representatives of 92 governments and 25 international organizations formed the World Conference on Special Needs Education, which was held in Salmanica, Spain. They agreed a dynamic new statement on the education of all disabled children, which called for inclusion to be the norm. Now, what is inclusion? Before going ahead, let's look at what is inclusion. Now in this diagram as you can see the green stars like shapes are basically signifying the normal children, the so called normal children and those yellow smileys basically represent the children with disability. Now in the first diagram what is happening is integration which we have been doing till now that is the first blue circle represents a school which is not having any child with disability whereas the other circle represents uh, a school where both disabled and non-disabled children are present. But the disabled children have been prepared in the special schools and then brought into these schools and integrated to these schools. 
Therefore, you can see the smileys are there in the margins, which shows that although the children with disability are present in the schools, but they have been given a different space in the school. They are not present along with the non-disabled children. They are not mixing, they are not having a curriculum which uh, even the non-disabled children are sharing with them. But if you see the next diagram, in that the again the blue circle represents a school where the children uh, who are so called non-disabled are present only. But after inclusion, the shape of the circle that is the school has changed into a star. It signifies that in inclusion, the school also has to change as compared to the upper diagram where the school did not change, it remain a circle only. But in inclusion, it is the responsibility of the school to change itself so that it can accommodate the children with disability meaningfully. Means they are participating equally with the so called uh, non disabled children. This is the first point. Second is as you can see in this diagram, the green uh, star like shapes and the yellow smileys they have been mixed in the school. So, the school is following a curriculum is planning those educational experiences which are meaningful for all these children and so they are kind of getting opportunities as their non disabled peers are also getting. So, the idea of inclusion basically means where the school is changing itself in terms of its infrastructure, in terms of its curriculum, in terms of its educational practices, in terms of its assessments, so that the disabled children feel engaged and empowered just like their non-disabled peers. Now again going back to the Salmanica statement which we are talking about, which brought inclusion as a norm. It also said that specifically for the children with disability that those with special educational needs must have access to regular schools which accommodate them within a child centered pedagogy capable of meeting these needs. Precisely what we talked about just now that the school has to change and therefore bring a child centered pedagogy where the disabled child also feels included. And the influence or the impact in Indian scenario was that India became a signatory to the Salmanica statement in 1994 and we could see that incorporation of the term inclusive education came in and was found in various official documents and reports in India. The next important breakthrough at the international level was the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities that is UNCRPD 2006. One, it adopted the social model of definition of disability in article 1 which says that which means that disability results from the interaction between the persons with impairment and attitudinal and environmental barriers that hinder their full and effective participation in society on an equal basis with others. Now, the social model differentiated between the two terms. It is the impairment which is belonging to the individual, means impairment lies within the individual, which is because of the medical condition that individual is in. And disability happens when the society is not prepared to include the disabled person in itself. So, impairment lies within the individual and disability lies within the society. So, these two terms were differentiated in this social model of definition which brought the onus onto the society. So, it said that it is the society which has to change itself. It is the society that has to make and create enabling environments and enabling context so that people who are impaired in any way are able to function efficiently. Other things which were included in this were the right to independent living under article 19, the right to accessibility under article 9, the right to inclusive education under article 24 and so on. The impact of United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability in India was that first we brought in the 86th amendment in 2002 which was enacted by the parliament which made education a fundamental right. 
The second important change was the right to education, to free and compulsory education, which is very popularly these days called as the RTE Act 2009. Most of us are aware of this act and what are the effects of these acts in the school system, we are already aware. The third is the latest and the most important, the rights of persons with disability, which is the RPWD Act 2016, which is the revised PWD Act 2005. Now, let's come on to the Indian scenario. In Indian context, we should begin with the constitution. What does the constitution say? The constitution of India on 26 November 1949 in its preamble ensures right to equality of status and opportunity, equality before law, non-discrimination and the right to life and liberty through its articles 14, 15, 19 and 21 respectively to all its citizens which includes persons with disabilities. The other thing is the article 45 of the constitution states that the state shall endeavor to provide within a period of 10 years from the commencement of this constitution for free and compulsory education for all children until they complete the age of 14 years. Now the mere provision if we look into this article the mere provision of free education for all children till the age of 14 years and not mandatory, not mandatory, I'm repeating, for the state to ensure that the provision was enabling every child to get educated. So it remained as a provision only and the, it is not mandatory for the state to do anything for the child. And that's why even after this, even after education became a fundamental right, nothing much happened. After this, when 86th Amendment 2002 came, which said that education is a fundamental right for all children from 6 to 14 years. Although education became a fundamental right, but children with uh, including the children with disabilities, but who would ensure that right, that was not clearly spelt out. That is, the duty of the state in this context was not defined. And thus, there the need of RTE Act or 2019, 2009. Before going to RTE Act 2009, we would also look at some of the policies, commissions and programs that have happened in India uh, in relation to education. The first being Kothari Commission which was 1964-66. It gave the idea of common and neighborhood schooling which also meant that all children irrespective of their state whether they are disabled or belonging to any marginalized group or they are belonging to a particular caste or creed they all are going to study in the neighborhood school in a common school. So there was no uh, uh, issue of discriminating children on the basis of uh, their backgrounds or their abilities. After that nine, uh, the national policy of education 1968 came in which talked about the integrated model which we had just uh, discussed about. Uh, as different from integration, as different from inclusion. So it promoted integration and therefore this integrated model where the handicapped children had to be prepared to study in regular schools. So the preparation had to be done in special schools and therefore the establishment of special schools. NPE 1986, it further uh, promoted integration and there was a lot of establishment of special schools where the disabled children would be prepared so that they could be brought into the mainstream schools or the regular schools. This was followed by Plan of Action POA 1992. Children with special needs would be educated only in regular schools, but the idea of mainstreaming was there. Now, idea of mainstreaming uh, gave a connotation that there was a hierarchy between the special schools and the regular schools. And that the re regular schools were the main schools and uh, the children who are there in the special schools, all the time they are prepared so that they can adjust themselves into the regular schools. And therefore, the idea remained that the child is going to change and the school will not change. There won't be any change in the school. The child helps to change and prepare itself so that the child can settle and adjust itself to the already structured schools that we have which we call as regular schools. In 1992, to further strengthen all this, the Parliament of India enacted the RCI Act or the Rehabilitation Council of India Act to establish a statutory mechanism 
for monitoring and standardizing the courses for training of 16 categories of professionals which were required in special education and rehabilitation of persons with disability. So again the work that was going on was how the disabled children could be taught in special schools, who will teach them, what will be the courses for those teacher educators and therefore a parallel system of education got established other than the regular system or the mainstream system as it was called that time. This was followed by the District Primary Education Program or DPEP 1994, a scheme launched by Government of India that supported again the integrated model in the form of IEDs that is Integrated Education of the Disabled. Finally, in 2000, Sarva Siksha Abhyan uh, or SSA that we popularly call as brought its zero rejection policy which stated that not a single child shall be denied admission in any school of his or her preference on the basis of caste, creed, gender, economic status and disability. This was a big change which was followed by the right of children to free and compulsory education that is the RTE Act 2009. Now this act which we are all familiar with, uh, I'll share a case before that. Now this is a news item which featured on 23rd of April this year only that means five days back which says that PMO official pulls up school for denying admission to a five-year-old type 1 diabetes. Now this child, five-year-old child is suffering from a autoimmune disorder which is type 1 diabetes because of which the child is supposed to take some insulin injections. Now the news item says that the child was denied admission by a public school in um, Pune and uh, the PMO official intervened in the whole case because it gave the uh, argument or the rationale that RT Act 2009 assures admission educational opportunity to every child irrespective of the condition of the child means that no school can deny whether public or government no school can deny admission to any child on any grounds and if the child requires something like for example if this particular child requires some medication in between between the classes the school has to make the provision that a doctor or a nurse whosoever medical professional is required for that particular need the school has to make that provision so it is rte is in tandem with what we discuss right now as inclusion that is the change has to be brought in the school and not in the child let's look at what rte says as a statement rte says it defines children belonging to disadvantaged group as child belonging to a disadvantaged group as one belonging to a scheduled caste, scheduled tribe, socially and educationally backward class or such other group facing disadvantage owing to social, cultural, economic, geographical, linguistic, gender or other similar factors as in chapter 1, article 2 to which children with disabilities were added through its amendment in 2012 means they were not there in 2009 but later they were added. The second is that the amendment made two more provisions for the children with disabilities considering that the education progression of a student with disability is slower and may take more years to complete the school education and children with severe disabilities may not be medically advised to attend school. Now these two provisions were one that children with disabilities including children with cerebral palsy, mental retardation, autism and multiple disabilities shall have the right to pursue free and compulsory education in accordance with chapter 5 of the PWD Act 1995 till the age of 18 years. Second, children with multiple disabilities and severe disabilities may also have the right to opt for home-based education. Now, these are two specific provisions which have been added specifically in the context of children with disabilities. The next act was the Right of Persons with Disability Act which is RPWD Act. It is actually the revised form of PWD Act, Persons with Disability Act that came in 1995. It defines disability as an evolving and dynamic concept in tandem with the idea that UNESCO propounds. The number of disabilities were 6 in DPEP program. 7 in PWD Act 1995 and it has been increased to 21 
in RPWD Act 2016 because it includes also people who are suffering from diseases like thalassemia or hemophilia or people who have suffered any kind of acid attack as these people have also been found that their normal body whether it's cognitive or physical functions have been affected in similar ways the right of persons with disability act also in its chapter 1 defines inclusive education as education uh, which uh, where in the students with and without disability learn together and the system of teaching and learning is suitably adapted to meet the learning needs of different types of students with disabilities it also defines universal design means the design of products environments programs and services to be usable by all people to the greatest extent possible without the need for adaptation or specialized design and shall apply to assistive devices including advanced technologies for particular group of persons with disabilities so as we can see even the rpwd act which is a act which was specifically made for disabled as compared to rte act which is for all children both the acts now are in tandem with each other and both of them are emphasizing on this point that school has to change and become an inclusive space and for becoming an inclusive space it needs to have a universal design a universal design means infrastructurally or educationally it has to prepare itself in such a way that all the children are uh, getting accommodated not only in terms of getting a space in the school but also in terms of meaningful engagement and empowerment in the school so we will conclude by looking at what implications do these have now these acts definitely say few things which as a teacher we should remember one a child with special needs is basically a child who because of his or her unique medical and development difficulties which we now refer as impairment has needs in addition to those of his or her peers and they have to be catered in the school in itself the school will cater it second special needs may range from mild to more severe and therefore we can have different provisioning for that school home schooling can also be one of the options if the disability is severe third most special needs respond well to treatment or special programs and services and that is why these special programs and services should also be located in the school premises apart from also getting in the home these children should also get it in the school whether it's speech therapist or any kind of intervention which is required last but not the least the teacher plays a very important role in accomplishing most of the needs of the child and therefore the rte act 2009 and rpwd act 2016 are very important acts which are related to the rights of the children in these contemporary times which every teacher should be aware of and they should be able to explain them to the parents and other stakeholders so that they can take informed decisions of Uh, for the child because today also there are many parents who uh, as soon as they see oh my child is a special child so i should send the child to the special school because they are not aware of these acts and what these acts are uh, making mandatory for the schools how these acts are forcing the schools to change themselves for these children and it's therefore the teachers somewhere it's the teachers responsibility to make the parents aware that Uh, there are other options for their children also it's not the special school but that their child now has a right to study in a regular school with other children and the school cannot deny admission as well as other provisioning for their child uh, there are some uh, readings which i have uh, brought for you that you can uh, refer to in context of the various rights policies also i have uh, listed the two acts rt act 2009 and their websites uh, which you can take down and these both the acts are available on these websites so um, i would request that all of you should go through the acts the acts have lot of rationale in it that why particular uh, statements have been given in the act so that rationale also should be understood by the teachers so i conclude by saying that the teacher has a major role to play Uh, these acts and policies would remain on papers only if 
we are not able to implement it and the major stakeholders in this process are the teachers. Thank you.